Now two views of where things stand. Vincent Warren is executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, which has defended detainees at Guantanamo and helped coordinate hundreds of lawyers providing pro bono legal work there. Dave, excuse me, David Rifkin is an attorney who served in the Reagan and first Bush administrations. He's filed Supreme Court and appellate amicus briefs in several leading national security cases since 9-11. And I'll try to keep my throat clear, clear, cold coming on. Welcome to both of you. Thank Vincent you. Warren, uh, what's your chief concern here with the new legislation, specifically when you look at the issue of indefinite detention of suspects? Well, you have to look at Guantanamo. Here we are 10 years later. There are only three ways that you get off the island of Guantanamo. One is by going to trial. Two is by being transferred to a third country. The third way is in a body bag. And the new legislation, the NDAA, which codifies indefinite detention, restricts the ability to be tried um, in federal courts. And it also restricts the ability for people to be transferred off the island. That's a huge problem. Do you, do you see this, David Rifkin, as something new? No, I do not. In fact, this legislation does not in any way alter the parameters of pre-existing law. <clears throat> Nobody who could not have been detained in military custody or prosecuted by military commission before NDEA was enacted would be brought into this regime now. The real thing, I think, that concerns people, and this debate really is a surrogate for the broader debate about the relevancy of a laws of war paradigm and to this conflict of its real war. The real significance of its legislation, frankly speaking, is it provided political imprimatur by Congress. For the first time, Congress has explicitly put its stamp of approval on what heretofore has been done, either based upon indirect congressional support and operation of military force, executive branch practices and judicial decisions. What's interesting, for years the critics have been asking for two political branches to speak in unison. They have done so now. They just don't like the answer. Well, what, 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 what is your response to that? I mean, well, in this broader context of the Congress and the White House. Well, I think the big problem <clears throat> here, of course, is that if you look at the indefinite detention pieces, particularly those um, with respect to can you detain U.S. citizens on U.S. soil, the potential for that, um, the Bush and the Obama administrations have taken the position that that is an author that is authorized under previous congressional authority but that's never been settled in the court so i disagree i actually don't think that this is status quo i think that what it does the codification really is about the calcification of an indefinite detention policy it's put indefinite detention on the table um, congress is setting the parameters for what that looks like and that's something that's new what Oh, go ahead. For respect, it's just not true. The Supreme Court and the plurality opinion by Justice O'Connor and Hamdi has clearly spoken the proposition that, and I hate the word indefinite because it's not true, you can detain an enemy combatant, including U.S. citizen, for duration of hostility. And all that really matters is an opportunity to, to challenge the status classification, the determination that person is an enemy combatant, and there's a fulsome process for it laid out in the Hamdi decision. We also have a Padilla decision. There's really nothing new about it. We frankly should be having a broader conversation about why it makes sense to use not solely, but at least part of an arsenal of tools available to our political branches, the laws of war paradigm. The problem, I'm afraid, with my colleague here, he really does not believe it. it's war. He thinks it's just another set of law enforcement problems to be treated purely for civilian justices. Well, well do you think, I mean, it, will you go to that kind of paradigm, or do you think this this the way we started this, which is looking at it through where to, how to uh, detain and how to try uh, the, the, the suspects is the way to look at it. We have in this country confused the war paradigm and the law enforcement paradigm, and the NDA is the is the is the precise example of that. You know, and my colleague is right that the Supreme Court has talked about. You mean it's codifying the the war Co the war approach? It's co it's, co it's codifying as one approach. It's right. codifying the conflation of it, in my mm -hmm. view, because the Supreme Court has spoken to that the case, the issue in Hamdi. But in the Padilla case, where you had someone that was captured in the United States, and the Bush administration tried to push him into military dis uh, custody before the Supreme Court could rule on it, the Bush administration moved him out because, frankly, because I thought that they thought that they were going to lose. So, in fact, the broader discussion really here is about to what extent um, should law enforcement actions and crimes be treated as crimes in the U.S., and to what extent should crimes of war and 
violations of the war uh, of, of law of war be treated as military well, let's be, situations. Let's be honest. Wars. Do you not accept the notion, as many critics allege, that they propounds the exclusive use of the civilian justice paradigm? Would you support the trial of somebody, at least high-value detainees, clearly individuals who are enemy combatants, by revamped military commissions that operate in full accordance with the Constitution with higher standards of military justice, or do you think that they're all just a bunch of muggers and, and rapists and bank robbers who shall be tried in the district courts? Oh, I would support I would support military courts for people who have violated the law of war. But what I don't support is a conflation of criminal activity and military activity by calling uh, the U.S. A battlefield and then anybody that's captured on the battlefield of the United States has the option of going to... Do you think, do you think that the, pre the president signed off on this with reservations? Do you think he just should not have signed off uh, on the bill altogether? I, I think that the president, when the president signed off on the uh, last NDAA, he signed off with reservations. Of course, one of his reservations was is that he would veto a future bill, which of course he didn't do this time. I don't think that that reservation is... Uh, and and, and what, of, what of Guantanamo, the, the 10 years later, here we are uh, on this Guantanamo day? Guantanamo is Where going to stay open, but again, as I said, Guantanamo is going to stay open prior to the passage of NDAA. But let's, let's, it's interesting. Let's look at it. Guantanamo has been condemned by this president. This president and his attorney general came in. They try to close it. They work through a political process. Lots of Democrats in Congress have opposed it. That's how political system works. When Guantanamo is going to stay closed, it's going to stay open. But not only is it a matter of political reality, Guantanamo is essential, not as a place, specific place. But ask yourself this question. If it's a real war, when have we ever had a war in human history that did not have a detention component, a, if you will, a prisoner of war camp? It's not just about people who are there now. Uh, I've, I've written about an individual by the name of Doug Duke who killed American soldiers in Iraq. We had no place to bring him here because the administration didn't want to put him in Guantanamo. All right, and a brief last word. Do you, do you see Guantanamo any change in the, in the future? Uh, that's not the, the question that really should be asked is when have we ever seen a war that has no location, no geographical limit, and no time limit? That's the situation that we're in now. Uh, we, that's why Guantanamo has to close. We do have to leave it there. Vincent Warren, David Rifkin, thank you both very much. Good to be with you. you.